Very good afternoon to all of y'all, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity and privilege to be able to share with you regarding Plasmodium nolosai. Now, Plasmodium nolosai is an emerging zoonotic uh, disease, malaria, in Southeast Asia. The first case of Plasmodium nolosai was reported in 1965. It was found in a US national that was working in Malaysia at that time. Since then, a large focus of naturally acquired P. nolosai infections was found to occur in humans in Kapit, Sarawak, and we were was uh, very well described in 2004 by Professor Balbe Singh and his team. Presently, the main form of malaria in Malaysia is due to Plasmodium nolosai, and it's also been found across the region in Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Southern China, Vietnam, Laos, Philippines, Singapore, Brunei, the Andaman Islands, India, Kalimantan, and Sumatra in Indonesia. So as you can see, this uh, disease is now very widespread in Southeast Asia and also in, uh, in the Andaman Islands in India. Now, uh, it, the reservoir of uh, Plasmodium nolosai is in a macaque species, and the vector is usually in the Anopheles leucospherus group of uh, mosquitoes, which is the mosquito vector. And where, where you have the vector and the macaques and the humans, uh, that is where the Plasmodium nolosai occurs, when these three groups of uh, um, animals and humans gather together. So, the, and it occurs in the same uh, the, uh, geographic uh, distribution that extends from India, Bhutan, Bangladesh, the Philippines, and southwards, southwards uh, to Indonesia. As you can see in the map there, uh, this is a, 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 a paper published uh, by Shearer et al. on the transmission risk of human plasmodium nolosai in Southeast Asia. And if you can look at Malaysia, uh, in Peninsular Malaysia, Borneo, and the entire Kalimantan and Sumatra, and also in Sulawesi, and also in Thailand, and also in Cambodia, you can see all the, the, the purple markings where the risk of zoonotic plasmodium nolosai malaria is very, very high. So, the natural host uh, is the simian malaria parasite. Uh, it's found mainly in the long-tailed macaques. Uh, these macaques are found everywhere in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, in Singapore, and it's very, very common. And also the pigtail macaques, uh, Macaca nemestrina. And this is a, uh, uh, a picture of the Anopheles uh, palabasensis uh, uh, mosquito vector, which is found mainly in Malaysia, especially in Borneo. And this is the main vector for Plasmodium nolosai. Here, this is a uh, life cycle of the Plasmodium nolosai. It's not very much different. It's not different from the other uh, uh, forms of malaria. The mosquito bites the, uh, the human and then it releases the sporozoids. And the sporozoids then infect the hepatocytes. And within the hepatocyte, there's a hepatite, hepatocyte cycle where uh, the hepatic schizon is formed and then it ruptures, releasing the merozoids. And then you go into the erythrocytic stage. The merozoids then infect the red blood cells. And then in the red blood cells, the early trophozoid is formed, the trophozoid is formed, and then you have the sky zones, and then it ruptures again. And then it, 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 it then goes on to infect other red blood cells. This is a 24 hour cycle. And some of them are formed as gametocytes, and the mosquito bites, uh, uh, bites and then it then transmits to other. Uh, monkeys or other humans. So the, the cases of Plasmodium nolosai falciparum vivax as seen in Sabah from year 2007 to 2019. It, and it's generally uh, the, the same as in the whole of Malaysia. As you can see in the red uh, and the blue, uh, Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium falciparum, our country is heading very well into malaria elimination with these two species of malaria. 
So the P5X and P5 superannuation have gradually come down very, very well up to 2019 and 2020, where we have hardly had any uh, local transmission of our Tasmanian files and our Tasmanian Vivex. On the other hand, if you look at the green um, uh, a graph, you can see Tasmanian molar side increasing from 2008, 2017, and 2018. The numbers are also rising. So it is a major problem in Malaysia. Now, Tasmanian molar side less cost debts. It, you know, formerly we used to think in the early 2000s before this that uh, it was only Tasmodium falciparum that causes severe pneumonia. However, we have seen known, since known that uh, non falciparum uh, plasmodium can also cause, uh, falciparum plasmodium can also cause severe malaria. Plasmodium monocytes is one of them, and another speaker will be speaking about plasmodium biovax as, as well. That means six malaria deaths occurred in Sabah in 2015 to 2017, and all of these were PCR confirmed as plasmodium monocytes. So this infection can kill. The median age was 40 years old with a range of 32 to 58 years old. Uh, four or 67% were male. Uh, three or 50 percent had significant cardiovascular comorbidities such as mitral stenosis, ischemic heart disease, and morbid obesity with heart failure. One of the patients was pregnant. Delays in administering appropriate therapy contributed to three about, or about 50 percent of the deaths. Uh, we were also actually in a way fortunate to be able to uh, get a po uh, postmortem on one of these patients. And what we found is we found malaria parasites uh, in almost all the organs, in the spleen, in the liver, in the brain, heart, lungs, and kidney. So it's totally and abundantly spread throughout the entire body. We also did a systemic review on all the uh, patients that were reported they, uh, who died because of uh, plasmodium monocyte. There are 32 cases of which are uh, in Malaysia, 56% uh, were male and the median age was 23 to 84 years of age. The risk of mortality we found was cardiovascular and metabolic uh, disease, 34%. Uh, uh, microscopic misdiagnosis, I'll come to that later. 90% of very high uh, percentage of people who died uh, had a microscopic misdiagnosis, were not diagnosed as a plasmodium molar site. And delayed commencing uh, intravenous antisuminate was seen in 36%. Now, the, the tragic uh, uh, aspect of uh, any malaria death is that I believe that all malaria deaths are listed, that all malaria deaths are actually highly preventable. And it, it, uh, of course, there are uh, um, uh, risk factors that uh, are non-modifiable, such as cardiovascular metabolic risk, but the microscopy uh, and the immediate uh, administration of in intravenous uh, artisanate that was not given was certainly something that was preventable. The overall case fatality rate we found during from 2010 to 2017 was calculated as 2.5 over 1,000. Females had a higher case fatality rate, 6 in 1,000 as compared to 1 in 7 per 1,000 for males. These are the independent risk factors for that. Female sex, an odds ratio of 2.6. Why female? We don't really know uh, why. It may be due to hormonal uh, um, differences between females and males. It's still something that we do not really know. Age, the older the person is, the higher the odds of the patient, actually, the risk of the patient actually dying of plasmodium molecule. So for more than 45 years old, the odds ratio was 4.7. Of course, there are health system issues as well. Delayed diagnosis of severe malaria despite uh, compatible clinical features. This very, very much depends on the experience of the doctors and medical officers who are treating these patients. Unavailability of IV artisanate. We still have areas that they don't keep artisanate. There are two cases. 50% of these cases were from non-citizens where we know in many, many countries, uh, uh, access to care by immigrants uh, is more difficult. 
and also late in presentation, whereby the few, uh, duration of fever is long. And this is because of the low uh, threshold of um, the, the, sorry, the very uh, low threshold of suspecting that the patients have, actually have malaria. And last but not least, barriers to accessing healthcare. As, as is found in many places in Sabah and Sarawak and many, many places where the malaria occurs. These are the keys to reduce the risk of mortality. One is early presentation. We need the patients to present early uh, to the healthcare facilities. Of course, um, the early part of the disease, patients don't feel very ill. It's only after a few days where they may actually feel sick enough to come to the hospitals. And in many places, to, in, in my experience in Sabah and certainly in Sarawak, it's not so easy for the patients to come to see the doctor. It's not that they have the clinics nearby. They actually have, some, some of them actually have to travel for, on foot and also on public transport for hours before they can come to a healthcare facility. And it's also difficult, it's also expensive for them. So uh, it's imperative that they present early, but it's not uh, as easy as uh, we, may, we may think. Second is rapid diagnosis. Rapid diagnosis very much depends on whether the doc doctor suspects or whether malaria is from a differential diagnosis of a person coming in with fever. And if the person is uh, suspected as having malaria, then a malaria slide will be done. And the malaria slide has to be read and reported within two hours so that treatment can be started uh, immediately. Uh, but it's not very, it's, it, this, this is not often the case where a person can get a rapid diagnosis. There have been cases where the diagnosis is only made after one or two days. And thirdly, after if the patient has been diagnosed as having severe malaria, immediate administration of IV intravenous artisunate is very, very important if the patient has severe malaria. So these are the three keys to risk uh, mortality of Plasmodium nolosai. This is a study that we did, which shows that limitations of microscopy to differentiate the Plasmodium species in a region that's co-endemic for Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, and Plasmodium nolosai. Uh, so this, I will just show you the slides to show you what I mean. You can look at the Plasmodium uh, nolosai early trophocyte with the ring stage and the PK at the, at the late stage where there's the band form and the PK gametocyte. And you compare that then with the slides of uh, P. falciparum at the early uh, ring forms trophozoid and the P. Uh, malaria trophozoid. You can see that there is a, uh, you, can see, you can understand why it's difficult for the microscopist to be able to differentiate uh, and diagnose the patient as having plasmodium nolosite. From my own personal experience, um, my friends, I, I do remember in the early 2000, before um, the papers were published on plasmodium nolosite, we used to complain and we used to be, you know, uh, we used to be, uh, complain actually about the, the diagnosis that we were given from, by the microscopies from the slides. So very often what you get is the first slide may come back come out as a plasmodium malaria. The second slide will come out as a mixed infection. And then the third slide will come out, will come out as a as plasmodium falciparum and so on. So we at that time we used to think that the microscopies, there's something wrong. Either the microscopies were not good or there are so many cases of mixing infections. So how do you decide what to what anti-malarials to keep these patients? So at that time we, we were also noticing that uh, at, the, at that time, uh, in the early 2000, that there were more and more cases of non severe non falciparum malaria. It, it's just that at that time, we did not know that the patients actually had plasmodium nolosai. So um, I think the lesson learned in plasmodium nolosai and in COVID and in all these new emerging diseases is that clinicians on the ground uh, need to suspect that, you know, there's something not right about the case that I'm seeing. And it was the case in Plasmodium Nolosai. We, we, were in, uh, we were actually confused and, and, you know, in a way incredulous on, on this uh, atypical uh, findings that we were finding in the microscopy. So we did a study on the microscopy findings and cross-check to see whether uh, the microscopy findings were accurate or not. 
So if you look at uh, the table one, uh, so we had two microscopists, one local in Kota Kinabalu, and this was cross-checked by a, another expert microscopist from a different country. So we had uh, a total of 134 uh, microscopy proven, microscopy uh, plus William falciparum. Out of 134, 110 were actually PCR, PF. However, 17, uh, 17 out of the 134 that were diagnosed as plasmodium falciparum were actually plasmodium molesi. Um, and when you look at the uh, PM and PK, uh, plasmodium malaria, uh, malaria or plasmodium molesi, that's how we we, uh, we, we we label them because of the difficulty in differentiating between PM and PK. 117 of the PM stroke PKs were di diagnosed microscopy as PMPK, but when they did the PCR, 94 were actually PK. And when we cross check, uh, you look at uh, table number two, 104 were PMPK by microscopy, but when we did the PCR, 94 were actually PCR positive for PK, meaning to say they did not have the relatively benign plasmodium malaria. Now, plasma malaria, you can still get severe malaria and plasma malaria. There have been cases that are reported severe plasma malaria, but it is very, very rare. On the other hand, PK, if it's missed and treated late, uh, late can be severe. So, 0.85% of PMPK were actually confirmed PCR as being malaria. On the other hand, 80.3% PMPK confirmed PCR to PC, uh, plus volume on the side. So all studies conducted in Malaysia show similar findings. Distinguishing between P falciparum, P vivex, and P molecide in a region where all three species frequently occur is challenging. Misdiagnosis can potentially lead to inappropriate treatment, including chloroquine therapy for P falciparum and a lack of anti relapse therapy for P vivex. A unified blood stage treatment strategy for all transmitted species is therefore essential. We also need to develop acute rapid diagnostic tests suitable for all species and the use of PCR confirmation for acute surveillance. So this is the approach for treatment of malaria. First of all is, do they have severe malaria? Yes, if they have severe malaria, then we give them IV artisanate. If they don't have severe malaria, are they vomiting? If yes, then we give IV artisanate. If no, then we uh, we look and see whether they have PF or PK. If they have PF or PK, we give ACT or REMAT. In PV, we give uh, ACT and primaquine. So this is the WHO's uh, criteria for severe malaria based on the clinical features and the biochemical features. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the clinical features are impact consciousness and any organ dysfunction. It's very hard to remember a list like this but a person with malaria with any organ dysfunction, such as heart failure, uh, CNS symptoms, uh, respiratory distress, jaundice, renal failure, they are classified as, uh, as severe malaria. And you also have the biochemical features of hypoglycemia, severe anemia, hyperlactemia, renal impairment, metabolic acidosis, hemoglobinuria, and hyperparasitemia. The definition of severe plasma neuroside malaria is it. The definition is important. We need to diagnose severe malaria in order because the treatment is different. The treatment for severe malaria is intravenous artisanate. So for plasminium nolicide, the threshold of parasitemia density in which we give IV artisanate is not 100,000 per microliter, but 20,000 per microliter in settings where laboratory criteria cannot be made. Now the treatment for an uncomplicated plasminium nolicide Previously, WHO and Malaysia MOH guidelines recommended chloroquine for P malaria nolosai infections. And this was actually shown in a prospective study by Danish Hua, uh, that chloroquine is indeed actually effective for the treatment of plasmodium nolosai uh, malaria. Uh, parasite clearance time was 3.1 hours, and 90% of parasite clearance were 10.3 hours, and there were no treatment failures. Other agents used successfully in humans for uncomplicated disease included artemitalumafentrine, dihydroartemisinin, piperaquine, atropone, 
proguanil quinine and metroquine. In the 2015 WHO treatment guidelines, in areas with chloroquine susceptible infections, treat adults and children with uncomplicated TYB, ovale, malaria, uh, nolocide with either ACT or chloroquine. Now, these guidelines were recommended prior to the RCTs that we did in Sabah. And this is the RCT. We did the RCT comparing artisanate, metroquine, and chloroquine. And in this study, it showed there were no treatment failures in road groups. However, well, there was better early uh, therapeutic response with ASMQ, where the parasite clearance time was shorter in the ASMQ group compared to the chloroquine group. And this translated to decreased bed occupancy, decrease in the risk of anemia at D28. There was one case of neuropsychiatric CS and first clearance with ASMQ. As, as you can see in the parasite clearance time, the parasite clearance time was faster or uh, more rapid in the artisanate metropoline group. Now, we don't usually use uh, artisanate metropoline because of neuropsychiatric uh, uh, side effects. So we use Rayamet, otherwise known as artimeter lobafentrin. We did another uh, randomized control trial, the CANMO study, which essentially also showed the same. Uh, results where the parasite clearance time was shorter in the artemeter loma factory group. There was decrease in risk of anemia at day 28 in the artemeter uh, loma factory group. So in Malaysia, ACT is preferred over chloroquine treatment of uncompleted uh, P molecide, irrespective of the presence of chloroquine susceptible P virus in the co endemic areas. So, malaria treatment guidelines for uncomplicated p side, according to Malaysian Ministry of Health guidelines, the first line is artemeter lumafentrin, and this needs to be taken together with a high fatty diet, such as biscuits or milk. Alternatively, you can use artisanate or met metrofrin combination or chloroquine. ACT is also recommended for uh, uncomplicated p and p vivex given the high rate of chloroquine treatment failure in both species in Malaysia. So a unified ACT guideline is, is important in co-endemic p uh, ACT will treat chloroquine resistant p falciparin and p vivex even if they are misidentified as p uh, So it's difficult, as I mentioned to you, it's difficult to differentiate the three sum. Often it's difficult. So you, when you give ACT, it will just cover all the malaria species. Of course, in p vivex you need to you, you, you need to add primaquid. Prima ACT has a faster parasite and fever clearance time, earlier hospital discharge, lowers uh, bed occupancy compared to chloroquine for penola sign, and ACT guidelines reduces the risk of chloroquine in advantly used for unrecognized severe nolocyte malaria. Primaquine is not needed for PK, penola sign has no hypnozoids, penola gametocytes using RT-PCR gametocytes to use 85% to 6% and 4% in the chloroquine. So we do not need primaquine because for two reasons. There are no hypnozoids and also the gametocyte clearance is also cleared by uh, the ACT and chloroquine. But the WHO treatment guidelines for severe malaria due to any pathogen species advocates the use of intravenous or intramuscular artisanate for at least 24 hours until they can tolerate oral medications complete with three days of ACT. It's very important, uh, my friends. Prompt and accurate recognition of severe disease is vital. So treatment for penolocyte malaria, severe penolocyte, IV artisan is effective for severe penolocyte. We did a retrospective study in Queen Hospital. At that time, we were still using quinine. Mortality of using quinine was 31% compared to 70% in IV artisanate. Of course, this was the retrospective study. And then we did a prospective study which showed that of zero mortality when IV artisanate was given, earlier district referral, and improved recognition of severe disease. IV artisanate is currently recommended if the parasite count is more than 20,000, whereby there's 11 fold risk severe disease. This is important because not many places you can do a blood test to see the renal function, the lactate levels. So we go by the parasite density count. If the parasite density count recommended is 20,000, then we give them IV artisanate. Regardless of whether they have uh, clinical or biochemical severe malaria, we give them um, IV artisanate. 
We also did a latest study where we actually brought down that number to 11, uh, 15,000 per microliter. So now it's in the, the density count is less than 15,000 per microliter, give IV artisonate. For children, there are no severe disease reported. Treatment guidelines are the same for adults, use AS and Q and chloroquine for birth, both used successfully with PCT. ACT and chloroquine successfully used in children, including two out of 44 that were given an initial dose of IV artisonate. Quinine, IV and oral have, have also been reported prior to change in treatment policy. Pregnancy, there were adverse maternal and fetal outcomes in patients who have malaria. Five patients with Melissa malaria pregnancy with treatment outcomes reported. Uh, chloroquine, quinine, and AL all were successfully cleared parasitemia uh, with a parasite clearance time of one to three days. The drug treatment, IV artisonate for severe malaria is 2.4 mg per kg step, then 12 hours later and then 24 hours. Change it to artimeter luma venetrin as soon as they're able to tolerate oral medications, usually after three doses of artisonate, and consider empirical antibiotics. Fluid management, excessive IV fluids, and severe falciparum malaria leads to poor outcomes. Uh, this is seen in the critical care method published in 2014. So, hence, conservative fluid replacement was safe in a study of hospitalized PF patients. Risk of ARDS and non cardiogenic pulmonary edema is at least as high in severe P nolocyte as in P pulsiparum. Conclusion conservative re uh, fluid replacement in PK is recommended. Do not pump in fluids to patients with severe malaria, PF or PK. Renal replacement therapy is advocated. Early hemodialysis may benefit uh, patients with severe malaria where available. Then don't forget supportive therapy. There is a role of antibiotics. Uh, we have seen patients with gram negative sepsis when they have severe malaria, probably due to bacterial uh, translocation. Uh, the, it, it is a zoonotic transmission. Therefore, uh, drug resistance is very, very rare. There will be no treatment failures reported in prospective series of uncomplicated malaria. Early treatment failure reported for oral therapy for severe disease have been, uh, have been reported. This includes chloroquine, chloroquine, sulfur, doxin, pyrimetamine, or mefloquine. Beware, uh, ladies and gentlemen, of lady atypical presentation. Abdominal pain has been associated with fatal cases, and it is an independent uh, predictor of severity disease. So the patient may actually come in with complaints of abdominal pain rather than fever, suspect. And in, because plasminia monocyte causes chromocytopenia, and so there's dengue. Co-infections uh, in places where there is dengue and malaria, you need to be very, very careful when you get a positive result for dengue. Make sure you check them for malaria as well. And this is a case report where fatal plasminia monocyte malaria because of atypical clinical presentation and delayed diagnosis. Patient presented with abdominal pain. At that time, he didn't have fever. Later on, found to have fever. But that time it was too late, patient died of severe malaria. Most patients have uncomplicated the, uh, 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 disease. 9.3% have only severe disease in adults, 5.8% severe disease in children and adults, 29.2% uh, tertiary adult, uh, in an adult hospital, and no severe disease was reported in children. With that, I'd like to thank you very much. I'd like to thank our research collaborators. Ministry of Health, the CRC, Medicine School of Health Research, the London School of Tropical Medicine. And I also like to thank uh, full appreciation to my colleagues, Associate Professor Dr. Yo Sinman, who's, a, uh, who's been very, very helpful and a good friend of mine, Professor Dr. Nick Anstey, Dr. Giri Shan, uh, Dr. Matthew Greg, uh, Professor Bridget Barber, Dan Cooper, Dr. Gerald Hennon. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention.